I'm Mert Straffer, and today I go behind the scenes of Utopia. I talk to narrator host Dan Perraro and the executive producer, John Kroll. Here with Dan Perraro, the narrator of Utopia. How did you get involved in this? I feel like the transition from comics to hosting uh, must have been a strange one. It was a very strange one. I'm still not entirely sure how it happened. <laughs> I keep telling people I accidentally got cast on TV. Um, a friend of mine uh, is one of the executive producers, and he just called one day and said, we're looking for an unusual voice, uh, something that's not really standard and typical, and I thought you might like to audition. I said, okay. So I did, along with many, many other people, and I accidentally got the job. The last minute they said, hey, let's put the narrator on camera. So boom, I'm on TV. It's still very weird for me. <laughs> You know, I, I've never heard of a, a host being called a narrator. Is there a specific difference? Because I feel like, you know, sometimes hosts become more active. You know, I, I'm thinking of maybe Cat Dealey on So You Think You Can Dance, who sometimes influences her opinion on things. Is it important for you to be a narrator and remain neutral at all times in terms of what's happening in Utopia? Uh, it's a, yeah, it's a bit of a hybrid what I'm doing. When I'm on camera, I'm the host, and when I'm off camera, I'm the narrator. <laughs> so I have to play both roles. Um, so, uh, and, and the, the, the real star, you know, this, this show isn't meant to have a star of any kind. So the, the, the people that you really want to be paying attention to are the people inside the compound. And, and so, yeah, I, I remain relatively neutral. Um, I like to live tweet during the episodes. And in those cases, I, I will often throw a funny aside here or there that I don't get to do on, on camera or within the show. So that's a lot of fun. But that's, that's, as, um, that's probably as uh, partial as I ever get. This is a, such a fresh genre. I feel like Utopia is breaking new ground in reality TV. Why do you think that it hasn't gone the route of like competitions, like all the shows that we're used to, especially in primetime network? You know, there's no immunity challenge. There's no evictions. And why is the show still successful even without that? Um, well, I think, uh, you know, ever since the beginning, the, the entire idea was to... Um, put these people together and see what kind of improvements they could make on society as a whole. Uh, so it really wasn't about a contest. It wasn't about a, a record contract or, a, or, or you know, succeeding in, in um, some kind of a competition. Um, and it was, it was really meant all along to be a social experiment. And so to keep that kind of thing clean, I think, and to keep it, to keep it uh, on track, you, you've got to take out the, the prize money up aspect of it or, or people are just uh, going to begin, begin behaving very unnaturally in order to win the money. Oh, I, I feel like this was a show that lives and dies by its cast. That was the first thing I said, especially without that competition element. And I feel like a lot of home runs have been hit. Specifically, I'm thinking of Red. I'm thinking of David. Were you surprised at how these characters just seemed to pop as soon as the show started? I, it was interesting, yeah. It was within the first few hours of the gates opening, uh, the place became pretty animated uh, and, I, and I think that's probably a tribute to the casting um, now there are, there are those detractors who will say it was just a lot of fighting but now after a few weeks everybody's saying this it's getting a lot more interesting because they're looking for ways to cooperate they're looking for ways to support themselves looking for ways to feed themselves and uh, and then they're also building these emotional bonds we have some romantic relationships we've had some contentions in there that that have been solved and you know people making up after big arguments and surprisingly i found myself being kind of touched in many of these episodes like oh that's so nice that they finally got bella that water filter <laughs> you know <laughs> Um, what is Dan's utopia? You know, I feel like that's the question that when everybody comes out of this, everybody's going to have a different take on what the experience was like. So what does your utopia look like? My utopia is to uh, have a successful career as a cartoonist and have a guy call you one day and say, do you want to, do you want to, <laughs> would you like to audition for a narration job and have it turn into a TV job? Because I'm just having a ball doing this. I mean, I kind of can't imagine any way to improve my life better. Um, uh, except uh, perhaps if I had a magic donkey. That, I've always thought that would be fun. And, and finally, can you talk about like how you, your dream sequence for how this show ends? You know, like do, does everybody hold hands and walk out together as like a united nation? Does everybody have their own definition? Like if you could end the show in the dream way possible, what would it be? Uh, I, I honestly, I have no idea. I can't imagine how the show will end. Maybe, maybe, maybe it'll just never end. Maybe it'll just go on and on and on, and uh, and they'll they'll create a true utopia, and it will grow larger and larger and encompass the entire world, and everyone will be happy forever. I'm I like it. That's, that sounds like an ending to me. Dan, thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you. Here with John Kroll, the executive producer of Utopia. Tell me, 
What has the experience been like, John? I can't even believe I'm here. This doesn't really look like Utopia. Uh, this is indeed Utopia. You're in the VIP room right now. The experience has been pretty incredible. There has been a lot of sleep involved. There's been a lot of stress involved. I have lost weight, so that's exciting. But uh, we're heading up uh, to the end of our, our first month in Utopia, and it's been nonstop action. <laughs> uh, you know, Utopia is a show that I feel like is really finding its footing and setting new ground, specifically in the genre of reality television. Can you talk a little bit about how you're breaking new ground versus just like recycling another competition show with immunity challenges? Well, one of the great things about this project is that the, everyone from the network to the production company to my fellow executive producers are really committed to doing a show that looks and feels different than anything anyone's ever seen before. So there are no manned cameras. There are no you know, interviews. There's no confessional room or anything like that. And it's funny because a lot of the social media people have said, we need a confessional to know what they're thinking. And then other people, before I can respond, say, no, that's why this show's different. That's why it's really cool and interesting. And we really like the fact that it's very observational, that there's not a lot of producer interaction. Um, we think that that's one of the great things about the show is it looks and feels different and feels more like a scripted soap opera than it does like a typical reality show. Uh, I know that Fox introduced a new twist today. It was just announced that there's a new voting system that's being put into place. Can you elaborate a little bit on how this is going to change the show? Sure. There's always been a replacement process as part of the show. We've slightly modified it from what's done in, in the Netherlands, mainly to simplify it and make it clearer because there was some uh, viewer confusion over it. And it's really straightforward right now. They boot someone out and then they welcome someone in. It's a lot more linear. So what's gonna happen is the Utopians will select two people who they think should be replaced by voting amongst themselves, and the viewers will select a third person, and then the Utopians will pick one of those three to leave, and in the event of a tie, a viewer vote will break that tie. After that's over, two new people will show up, Newtopians we like to call them, and a few days later, the, the 14 remaining Utopians will vote for one of them to become a permanent member. Once again, the viewers will vote to break the tie in the event of a tie. Can people really be eliminated from Utopia? Well, sure. If, uh, you know, there's, there's certainly a lot of talk about it right now. But, yeah, one of these 15 pioneers will be leaving Utopia forever. I, I want to talk a little bit about Dedeker. I love Dedeker. I think Dedeker is probably setting a new standard for what I look for in females on a reality show. Can you talk a little bit about her? What can we expect from her? What do you know that the viewing audience hasn't seen? Just remember, Dedeker is not a, not a one-man woman. So are you good at sharing? Well, this is the whole thing. I feel like then your odds go up, right? It's not like I'm against Brad Pitt. You know, we can all actually no. I don't want to touch that. All right. Well, here's what I can tell you. I will give you. You want a scoop, don't yes. you? I want a scoop. You yes. Want some kind of scoop. Well. Uh, the scoop I can tell you is this. Um, there was a beekeeper uh, who showed up uh, yesterday, and the entire compound was a buzz because he's a handsome fellow who, uh, who uh, Nikki took a special liking to. Um, but what I can tell you, what we have learned about the beekeeper that the Utopians don't yet know is the beekeeper actually is polyamorous. So we're curious uh, uh, if, if he makes it that known, since he obviously knows that Dedeker's polyamorous. He didn't force the issue this last time. But once the Utopians find out he's polyamorous, is that going to make him more interesting to, uh, uh, to Dedeker? Will it make him more or less interesting to Nikki? We're not quite sure how much business will be done with the beekeeper. That's up to the Utopians. But we think that's something that could come into play based upon Dedeker's uh, known proclivities. John, why should people watch Utopia for those who haven't seen it before? I think the reason to watch Utopia is the same reason that people fell in love with reality television in the, the turn of the 21st century to begin with. Uh, my theory about the birth of reality television, and I think you'll enjoy this as an aficionado of the genre, is that people were getting bored with multi-camera sitcoms and procedural dramas, and they wanted something where the ending was not predictable. The early survivors and that sort of thing, the hero can die at any time. They can vote off the strongest person. In fact, they're likely to at any time. Now we've gotten into reality shows that have become a lot more for formulaic, a lot more predictable. We can predict the alliances that happen on all the competition reality shows now. 
And I think in Utopia, it truly is unpredictable. Red really could walk out at any time. In fact, he seems to just about every episode. Uh, so could Bella. We don't know who's going to connect with who. It's really a mystery to those of us who are the producers. It's laughable to me, the people online who suggest the show is scripted. How could we possibly come up with these storylines? It's all we can do to help the show make air every week a couple of times. So I think it truly is the most unpredictable show on television. We don't know what's going to happen next. So how can you, the viewer, know? I love it. John, thank you so much. Utopia Tuesdays and Fridays on Fox. Are you going to shake my hand or are you just going to leave me hanging here? I'm going to leave you hanging. Okay. Oh, okay. Here. You're all right. So, John, tell me, what is the secret of Utopia? How does this whole control room work? Well... It's complicated, but I'll do my best to give you a brief version of it. We have 130 cameras, but only 12 of those are being recorded at any one time. Those 12 are on these screens right here. Records uh, 1 through 6 are down here, and 7 through 12 are, are uh, up here. And these record in continuous, non-stop streams of video, 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. So we record 12 times 24, 288 hours of content per day. So in order to process that much creative content, we have to have a really a highly tuned system that, that can enable us to be able to edit it into an episode that's gonna air in just a couple of days. Here's how we do it. Um, if you look in the room behind me, you can see that top grid has 120 of the 130 cameras. There's 10 more that are below there that uh, you can see inside. The front row people are choosing which cameras are actually being recorded in these 12 continuous streams and the people on the outside are the robotic camera operators. We have no manned cameras so those four camera people are controlling all 130 cameras. Loy, is this kind of like a video game? Uh, very much so. It's like electronic chess and camera and a video game and flying a plane all at the same time. The second role a row are story people. Those are the people who are, are choosing which scenes to cover, what's the most interesting thing going on at any one time, and snooping around that, uh, the, uh, the compound uh, with the person we call the spy to make sure we're not missing something more interesting. So one person's tracking the stories that we're actually covering, the other person is making sure we're not missing something better. This Solana, she's a story producer. She's the one who's deciding what's going to go into the Tuesday show that's airing. What have you found so far today? Uh, okay. Tell me about what's going on this morning. The vet angels are there to give the calf the first vaccination, and it got its first feeding. Because the calf was born this morning, right? Wasn't that exciting? It was very exciting, yeah. But John, don't you decide what goes in the show? No, Alana makes I, all the tough decisions. all the tough decisions. Yeah, I just, <laughs> I just watch the show when it's done. <laughs> And then back on this la back row, we have technical people who are doing things like monitoring the computer use to make sure they're not going to unauthorized sites, doing the lighting, which is dormant right now because it's during the day, and also the color correction of the cameras. We can do that in post-production, but we try and make our, camera, our shots look as pretty as possible. Mm -hmm. And with 130 cameras, that's an ongoing process, obviously. Uh, also, there's audio that's behind there as well. This is the audio room. This is where we're mixing all the channels from both the, uh, the, the, the radio mics that each of the cast has on, as well as all the ambient mics, 40 or 50 of those that we have around the compound. He has microphones where people don't know so if they sneak off and try to ha get a little action without their microphones, mm -hmm. he's got them covered. Nice. Well, that wraps up my tour of Utopia. Stay tuned to the show Tuesdays and Fridays on Fox.